Good afternoon. Welcome to the boardroom of the National Transportation Safety Board. I'm Robert Sumwalt. I'm honored to serve as the chairman of the NTSB. Joining us today are my colleagues, Vice Chairman Bruce Landsberg, Member Jennifer Homedy. Today we meet in open session as required by the government and the Sunshine Act to consider a collision between a vehicle controlled by a developmental automated driving system and a pedestrian in Tempe, Arizona on March the 18th of last year. The pedestrian was pushing a bicycle across a street mid-block when the vehicle struck her at about 39 miles per hour. Tragically, she died. On behalf of all of us here at the NTSB, I'd like to offer our sincerest condolences to the families and friends of that lady who lost her life. Our entire purpose for being here is to learn from tragic events like this so that they can be prevented in the future. Last year, the NTSB published a pedestrian safety report, and the pedestrian in this particular event was a particularly high risk of being struck, regardless of the striking vehicle. But today is also about the vehicle that struck her, the safety culture of the company that was testing it, and the industry, the state and federal safety risk management requirements for testing automated driving systems on public roads. The crash vehicle was operated by Uber's Advanced Technology Group, or Uber ATG. It was a Volvo XC90 that Uber ATG had modified with a proprietary developmental automatic driving system. This was not a self-driving car. We're not there yet. The crash vehicle could drive on pre-mapped roads, pre-mapped routes with an, alt, uh, with an attentive operator. But as it has been widely reported, the vehicle operator was not paying attention at the time of the crash. And furthermore, although the vehicle sensors first noted the pedestrian at 5.6 seconds before the impact, the system waffled between classifying her as a vehicle a bicycle, or other. We will discuss Uber ATG's decision to deactivate Volvo's factory-installed forward collision warning system and the automatic emergency braking system while the vehicle was being operated in the test automatic driving system, or ADS, mode. We'll also consider Uber ATG's post-crash accidents regarding these systems. But the lessons of this crash do not only apply to Uber ATG, they are, and they're not limited to just simply something went wrong and now it's fixed. Rather, it's something went wrong and something else might go wrong unless, it, unless it's presented, prevented. After the crash, as specific technical limitations and safety risk were understood, Uber ATG learned and improved the schema but at the time of the crash, the company was not continually monitoring its own operations to avoid or mitigate potential risk. The inappropriate actions of both the automatic driving system as implemented and the vehicle's human operator were symptoms of a deeper problem, the ineffective safety culture that existed at the time of Uber ATG. In organizational safety, a safety management system, or SMS, helps to build an effective safety culture. An SMS includes safety policy, safety risk management, safety assurance, and safety promotion. And I'm glad that we'll have the opportunity to discuss SMS today. But this crash was not only about Uber ATG self-drive in Arizona, or test drive in Arizona. This crash was about testing the development of automatic, automated driving systems on public roads. Its, less, its lessons should be studied by any company testing in any state. If your company tests automatic, automated driving systems on public roads, this crash, it was about you. If you use roads where automated driving systems are being tested, this crash, it was about you. 
And if your work touches on automated driving systems at the federal or state level, guess what? This crash, it was about you. For anybody in the automated driving system space, let me be blunt, Uber ATG is working now on an SMS. Are you? You can. You don't have to be, you don't have to endure the crash first. In today's board meeting, the staff will present, they'll lay out the pertinent facts and analysis that are found in the draft report. They will present their findings, the probable cause and recommendations to the board. Then we on the board will question the staff. We will discuss and vote on any proposed amendments. The idea is that when we adopt the report this afternoon, it will truly provide the best opportunity to enhance safety. The public docket for this report contains 439 pages of additional information, including factual re reports of the investigation, the submission by Uber ATG and Volvo, and other relevant material. And it's available at www.ntsb.gov. And once finalized, the accident report will also be available at that same website. Now, Deputy Managing Director Paul Sledzik, if you'll kindly introduce the staff. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, before I begin, I have a few announcements for the audience. I kindly request that if you've not done so already to please silence your mobile phones and other electronic devices. There are two exits from this boardroom. Uh, one is to my left at the front of the auditorium here on either side of the dais. You'll note the exit signs. If you have to exit that way, please go down the stairs through the, through the doorway and you'll, be, you'll enter into the uh, underground hallways below the, uh, the hotel and the promenade and we'll find an exit from there. The other exit is the way that you came in through the, the doors at the back of the auditorium. So please walk up the, uh, the aisles towards the back, uh, out the glass doors. And once you, once you exit the facility, turn left and walk to the end of the street. Uh, NTSB staff and the security personnel will be around to direct you in the event of an emergency. There's also an AED device located in the lobby of the boardroom and security personnel can call 911 if needed. And please don't hesitate to contact anyone with the NTSB if you have any questions. Seated at the panel this afternoon, unless otherwise noted, are staff members of the Office of Highway Safety. To my right is Dr. Kristen Poland, who is deputy director in that office. To her right is Dr. Ensar Becic, the project manager in that office. Next to Dr. Becic is uh, Mr. David Pereira, who is the investigator in charge for this accident. To his right is Dr. Rafael Marshall, a human performance investigator in the highway office. And next to Dr. Marshall is Mr. Michael Fox, an operations investigator in that office. Behind Mr. Fox on the next table, is Mr. Robert Squire, who's a technical reconstructionist from the highway office. Next to him is Ms. Julie Perot, a safety recommendations specialist in the Office of Safety Recommendations and Communications. Next to Ms. Perot is Dr. Mary Pat McKay, who is one of the agency's medical officers from the Office of Research and Engineering. Next to Dr. McKay is Mr. Jim Ritter, director in the Office of Research and Engineering. Next to Mr. Ritter is Ms. Ms. Kathleen Silbaugh, who's the agency's general counsel. And next to Ms. Silbaugh is Mr. Jeff Marcus, who is the Chief of the Safety Recommendations Division in the Office of Safety Recommendations and Communications. Behind Mr. Marcus is Mr. Mark Banyard, who will be handling audio, audio visual and timing uh, this afternoon, also from the Office of Highway Safety. Next to Mr. Banyard is Dr. Lissandra Gary Vega, who is Chief of the Report Development uh, Office or Division in the Office of Highway Safety. Next to Ms. Uh, Dr. Gary Vega is Ms. Charlotte Cox, who's the report editor for this uh, report. And finally, next to Ms. Cox is Mr. Sean Payne, a recorder specialist from the Office of Research and Engineering. And we'll start off this afternoon with a crash overview by the IIC investigator in charge from this accident, David Pereira. Good afternoon, Chairman Salmoa, Vice Chairman Landsberg, and Member Hamidi. Staff today is presenting for your consideration a report on the collision between a vehicle controlled by a developmental automated driving system and a pedestrian. The crash occurred on Sunday, March 18th, 2018 at 9.58 p.m. Mountain Standard Time in Tempe, Arizona. That is located east of Phoenix, as shown here on the map. An automated test vehicle based on a modified 2017 
Volvo XC90 Sports Utility Vehicle, or SUV, struck a pedestrian walking mid-block across North Mill Avenue. At the time of the crash, it was nighttime, the road surface was dry, and the roadway was illuminated by street lighting. As a result of the crash, the pedestrian died and the operator was uninjured. The SUV was operated by the Advanced Technologies Group, ATG, of Uber Technology Incorporated, which had modified the vehicle with a proprietary developmental automated driving system, ADS. It was occupied by a female vehicle operator in the driver's seat. It was being controlled by the ADS at the time of the crash. The 2017 Volvo XC90, as a production vehicle, met all the required Federal Motor Vehicle Standards, or FMVSS. There are no current standards or any assessment protocols for automated driving systems. So by adding the ADS, Uber ATG did not invalidate any of the FMVSS already on the Volvo platform vehicle. Therefore, Uber ATG test vehicle met all required federal requirements. This slide shows a Google Earth view of where the crash occurred in the surrounding area during daylight. The SUV was completing the second loop of an established test route that included North Mill Avenue, as shown here. The vehicle had been operating about 19 minutes in autonomous mode when it approached the collision site in the right lane at the posted speed limit of 45 miles per hour, shown here in yellow arrow. By that time, the pedestrian began walking mid-block across North Mill Avenue where there was no crosswalk, pushing a bicycle by her left side, shown here by the red arrow. The nearest crosswalk was 380 feet north of the crash location, shown here in red. According to ADS data, the system first detected the pedestrian 5.6 seconds before the crash. It initially classified the pedestrian as a vehicle, subsequently also as an unknown object, and as a bicyclist. This slide is going to show the path of the pedestrian as she attempted crossing North Mill Avenue and the movement and speed of the SUV at four points. The pedestrian's path shows her position at the time of initial detection at 5.6 seconds until impact. The SUV's position is shown at corresponding times beginning 4.2 seconds before impact. Although the ADS continued tracking the pedestrian until the crash, it did not correctly predict her path or reduce the SUV speed in response to the detected pedestrian. This classification sequence will be presented by Dr. Bishop. By the time the ADS determined that a collision was imminent, the situation exceeded the response specification of the ADS braking system, relying instead on the operator's intervention to avoid a collision or mitigate an impact. This slide shows the investigative staff. This slide shows the report development staff. This slide shows the parties to the investigation. In this crash, staff identified the following safety issue areas, which will be presented to the board today. Uber's ATG's inadequate safety culture, the need for safety risk management requirements for testing automated vehicles on public roads. That concludes my presentation. Dr. Marshall will now discuss the pedestrian and the vehicle operator and how their actions contributed to the crash. Good afternoon. In this presentation, I'll discuss the pedestrian and her activities up to the point of the crash, then follow with information about the vehicle operator, her duties at Uber ATG, and her activities leading up to the crash. The pedestrian was a 49-year-old female without a known address. On the night of the crash, she had been wearing a dark top and blue jeans and had been walking mid-block across North Mill Avenue with a bicycle on her left side. The bicycle was equipped with an illuminated headlight 
but the side reflectors on the two wheels were absent. The investigation revealed that the pedestrian would have had a clear view of the test vehicle's headlights more than five seconds before impact. The outward facing dash camera on the vehicle showed that the pedestrian turned her head towards the oncoming vehicle about a second before impact. Post-crash toxicological testing indicated that the pedestrian had a high concentration of methamphetamine in her blood, as well as an inactive metabolite of marijuana. The high level of methamphetamine suggested impairment and current misuse, which could affect perception and judgment and cause anxiety, confusion, mood disturbances, paranoia, hallucination, and slowed reaction time. I would now like to discuss the vehicle operator, a 44-year-old female with a valid non-commercial driver's license. Her driving history indicated two speeding convictions and no reportable crashes in the past seven years. She was vetted and eventually hired by Uber ATG in June 2017. Her employment records indicated that she had completed all her required training and her work history did not contain any reprimands. She was very familiar with the test vehicle and she had completed the route that she had been assigned on the day of the crash on 73 previous occasions. As a vehicle operator, her primary tasks were to monitor the driving environment and take control during emergency situations to prevent a crash from occurring. These situations could be due to the automated driving system itself or by actions of other road users. The vehicle operator could take control by steering, braking, accelerating, or by pushing down on the red ADS disengagement knob. In order to shorten reaction times in emergency situations, vehicle operators were trained to hover their foot and hands over the brake pedal and steering wheel in a ready position. Another vehicle operator task was to alert Uber ATG engineers to objects, events, or issues of interest. This was done through a tablet computer mounted at the, on the center console, console of the vehicle. All interactions with the tablet were simplified to minimize distraction. The vehicle operator would only have to touch one of the four icons shown at the bottom of the tablet to issue the appropriate alert. As shown on the display, um, were also the route of the test vehicle and the ADS engagement status. Staff reconstructed the vehicle operator's activities on the days before the crash and found that she had adequate sleep opportunity. She began her shift around 7.30 p.m. on the day of the crash. She performed a diagnostic on, on the test vehicle before beginning her assigned route at 9.14 p.m. The crash occurred about 45 minutes later. Dash cam footage showed that prior to initiating her route, the operator removed a cell phone from a bag. Although the footage does not show where she placed the phone, evidence suggests that she placed it in a slot just below the tablet computer. In the 31 and a half minutes that the test vehicle was moving, the operator spent 34% of her time glancing down at that spot below the tablet computer. One glance lasted 26 and a half seconds. During the final three minutes, the vehicle operator looked down 23 different times. The operator's final glance occurred six seconds before impact and lasted for five seconds. She returned her gaze to the road about one second before impact. Records obtained during the investigation revealed that the operator had been streaming a television show at the same time she had been operating the test vehicle. Unfortunately, this is not a common occurrence in cases where a human operator is tasked with monitoring an automated system, especially one with a low failure rate. The term automation complacency has been used to describe situations where an operator fails to conduct sufficient checks of an automated system 
assuming all is well when a dangerous condition could actually be developing. The Tempe police examined the vehicle operator after the crash and noted no signs of impairment. Based on data collected by Uber ATG, the vehicle operator last interacted with the tablet computer 19 minutes before the crash, and no alerts displayed in the minutes prior to the crash. This suggested that it was not the cause of the vehicle operator's distraction. When factoring in the roadway geometry, the sight distance, and the lighting conditions, staff estimated that an attentive vehicle operator would have had between two and four seconds to detect the pedestrian and avoid or mitigate the impact. In summary, the pedestrian was likely impaired by the effects of methamphetamine prior to the crash, which likely diminished her judgment and perception as she crossed an unprotected section of North Mill Avenue. In addition, visual distraction brought on by automation complacency resulted in the vehicle operator's inability to detect the pedestrian in time to avoid the collision. This concludes my presentation. Dr. Betchett has the next presentation. Good afternoon. In this presentation, I will describe the Uber ATG test vehicle while focusing on the ATG's developmental automated driving system I will also discuss the factory-equipped Volvo's collision avoidance systems. More specifically, I will describe the ADS that was in operation at the time of the crash, including its functionality, and also discuss the post-crash changes that Uber ATG made pertaining to ADS design and testing. The 2017 stock Volvo XC90 was the platform on which Uber ATG installed its developmental ADS. The ADS consisted of multiple sensory and imaging systems, including a single LIDAR, several radars positioned around the vehicle, multiple cameras providing a 360 degree coverage, along with the supporting systems. The input from all the sensors, sensors and the cameras was processed by the accompanying computing units located in the back of the vehicle. The test vehicle was factory equipped with various CAS, including forward collision warning and automatic emergency braking. These systems are standard equipment on this Volvo model. However, the Volvo collision avoidance and other active assistance systems were disabled during ADS operation. The reason for this action was to, due to high likelihood of signal misinterpretation by the Volvo and ATG systems radars because they operated on the same frequencies. So back to the developmental ADS. ADS could be activated only when the vehicle was located on a designated pre-mapped route. Uber ATG has developed high definition maps for all the routes on which it conducts testing. The ADS was being designed to be fully autonomous along a pre-mapped route and as such to perform all driving tasks, including vehicle control, as well as monitoring the environment. As discussed earlier by Dr. Marshall, the operator inside the vehicle was also tasked with monitoring the environment and taking control of the vehicle when necessary. Considering that this was a developmental vehicle and the role of the operator was safety critical, the operator would be considered as a part of the system. So how does the ADS move the vehicle along the route? We can use this diagram to provide the general description of ADS operation on a designated route. When operator engages the ADS, the system follows the initial motion plan of the vehicle, which includes factors such as desired speed during specific segments or where to turn. At the same time, the system's sensors monitor the environment, which along with their computing units perform the process of machine perception. As part of the perception process, sensors detect objects in the environment. When an object is detected, it is identified. The ADS classified the detected objects as a vehicle, pedestrian, bicycle, or as an unknown other object. As the next step in the perception process, the system predicted the object's intent, its possible paths. The ADS relied on multiple factors for path prediction, including 
assigning specific inherent goals to some objects, for example, a vehicle or a bicycle detected in a lane of travel would have an inherent goal of traveling in the direction of traffic in that lane. The system also looked at the object's tracking history, its previously detected locations, and also whether the identity of the object, its classification, has persisted or has changed. Based on these and other factors, the system determines whether the detected object is on the path of the test vehicle. If there is a conflict, the system then modifies the vehicle's motion plan accordingly by braking or changing lanes. And then the loop starts again. I would like to, at this point, emphasize that machine perception is extremely challenging, not only in detecting a particular object, but also in determining its intent and whether it poses a hazard. It is worth noting that at this time, there are no production level vehicles that do not require constant driver monitoring or at least require drivers to take over when prompted by the system. In other words, the challenge of full vehicle automation has not yet been solved. For that reason, testing of a developmental ADS is expected to contain errors and to expose systems limitations, particularly in perception. And the risk that such testing poses depends on the presence of appropriate safety redundancies and risk mitigation strategies. The following are a few specific ADS design considerations pertaining to perception that Uber ATG had at the time of the crash. Some objects were not assigned a specific inherent goal, like unknown objects. In contrast, the goals of a pedestrian depended on its detected location. Pedestrians could be assigned a goal of crossing a street, but only when in the vicinity of a crosswalk. Pedestrians outside a crosswalk would not be assigned an inherent goal of crossing the street, a goal of jaywalking. Additionally, when the system changed the classification of a detected object, it no longer considered the object's tracking history when generating new path predictions. So for a newly reclassified object, the predicted path depended on its goal. At the, same, at the time of the crash, the ATG's automated driving system also had specific protocols for handling of emergency situations, which were considered as those requiring a rate of deceleration greater than 0.71 G, among other metrics. Upon detection of such situation, the system was designed to suppress braking for one second out of real concern for false alarms. Typically, such situations would resolve themselves or the operator would take control of the vehicle as they were tasked to do. However, if the hazard remained after one second without the operator taking control, the system was designed to engage maximum braking only if such action would prevent the crash. If the crash could not be avoided, the system was designed to disengage and alert the operator. Mr. Pereira has earlier presented the movements of the pedestrian and the test vehicle leading up to the crash. The following slides will also present those movements with the additional information showing how the ADS had classified the detected pedestrian and had predicted its path. The system had initially detected the pedestrian 5.6 seconds before the crash and had it classified as a vehicle but was unable to predict its path. The following are a few examples of the system incorrectly classifying the pedestrian and assigning an incorrect path prediction. For the next several seconds, the ADS changed the classification multiple times, from a vehicle to a bicycle to other. As a result of the incorrect classification, the system's prediction of the object's path also varied from unknown to traveling in the left through lane, to static. 1.2 seconds before the crash, the system had detected an emergency situation. The detected object, which was classified as a bicycle at that time, was located fully on the motion path of the test vehicle. The system initiated suppression of braking, and one second later, the detected object, the bicycle, was still fully on the path of the test vehicle. At that time, the system alerted the operator that it was disengaging, 
just before the vehicle struck the pedestrian. At the time of the crash, Uber ATG's automated driving system lacked functionality to anticipate the possibility of pedestrians crossing the street outside a crosswalk. It relied on consistent tracking and classification. The design of the ADS included application of emergency braking only if such action would have prevented the crash. The design did not allow braking solely for crash mitigation. The Volvo AEB system, which had greater braking capability than the emergency braking of the ADS, was disabled due to technical challenges. These three design considerations have each limited layers of safety redundancy, thereby increasing the risk of testing on public roads. But the lack of any single layer of safety redundancy may not necessarily be detrimental to the overall system design, which is why a comprehensive examination of an overall risk management is necessary. In this crash, the vehicle operator was the final redundant countermeasure in case of a potential hazard. And as we have seen, this countermeasure has failed. After the crash, Uber ATG made numerous changes, including in organizational, oversight, and technical areas. The most prominent changes in the area of ADS design included that the system can anticipate jaywalking pedestrians and assign such goals, that the Volvo AEB remains active during ADS operation, that ADS emergency braking would activate even if only to reduce the severity of a crash. And additionally, Uber ATG has gradually removed the use of braking suppression in emergency situations. Some of the technical changes in the ADS functionality added layers of safety redundancy, thereby decreasing risk associated with testing on public roads. In summary, some of the ADS limitations and design considerations that Uber ATG had at the time of the crash affected the system's capability to detect the conflict in time and at least mitigate the crash. Risk management, both in ADS design and particularly in mitigation strategies pertaining to vehicle operators, were deficient. After the crash, Uber ATG made considerable changes in ADS design some of which directly affected the crash-relevant factors. Those changes have added layers of safety redundancy, thus decreasing risk. ATG has also made changes in the other critical layer of safety redundancy, the vehicle operator, who was part of the system. This topic of vehicle operator oversight, along with the examination of ATG's inadequate safety culture, which resulted in these risk management deficiencies, will be discussed in the next presentation by Mr. Fox. Good afternoon. In this presentation, I will first provide an overview of the organizational structure at Uber ATG and review how the inadequate pre-crash safety culture led to the conditions that were causal in this crash. Weaknesses were identified with the company's organizational framework for risk mitigation, how policies and procedures were implemented, and the lack of appropriate vehicle operator oversight. Secondly, I will review the actions that were taken by Uber ATG after the crash and discuss how the company took corrective action to make significant organizational changes, initiated a safety management system, and has taken steps to create a new corporate safety culture. Uber was founded in 2009 as a ride-sharing company. At the time of the crash, the company had six divisions. One of the divisions is called Uber ATG and is responsible for developing the automated vehicle platform. Uber ATG was established in 2015 and is headquartered in Pittsburgh. At the time of the crash, Uber ATG employed over 1,000 personnel and had five test locations in the US and Canada. One of the test sites was located in Tempe, Arizona, which is the facility where the accident driver reported. The purpose of the Tempe operations was to test the automated driving platform and provide data for improving the system. 
At the time of the crash, the Tempe facility garaged 40 ATG test vehicles, employed 254 vehicle operators, 16 supervisors, and administrative staff personnel. This investigation determined that Uber ATG was missing several basic elements that support a strong safety culture. For example, Uber ATG did not have a corporate safety plan or guiding document that identified individual employee roles and responsibilities to manage safety. Uber ATG also lacked a safety division and did not have a dedicated safety manager responsible for risk assessment and mitigation. Uber did have safety policies that included no cell phone use or texting, a drug testing program that consisted of pre-employment, random, and post-crash testing, seatbelt use, and maximum driving policy. The company also had a tier disciplinary program that was based on infractions that for serious violations could result in action up to and including termination. Although Uber ATG had policies as mentioned, these policies were not standalone policies, which is typical for industry best practices. Uber ATG also lacked a fatigue management program, a fundamental component of good safety culture. Although the company had a drug testing policy, although the company had a drug testing program, it was sporadic and not implemented on a consistent basis. In fact, the accident driver was never drug tested and despite company policy did not receive a drug test after the crash. Additionally, although the company's cell phone policy stated that using a cell phone or texting while operating a test vehicle was considered the most serious or critical violation and could result in termination, the company relied on other drivers to report infractions. There were several deficiencies that highlight the events that led up to this crash. Of note was the lack of appropriate oversight for vehicle operators. For example, Uber ATG made the decision to reduce the testing procedures using two vehicle operators to one. By doing so, Uber ATG removed a layer of safety redundancy. The second vehicle operator can be viewed as a mechanism for detecting a hazardous situation or could assist in the vehicle operator's duties. Furthermore, although the ATG test vehicles were equipped with an inward-facing video camera, as highlighted in yellow, Uber ATG management did not consistently monitor the video or conduct spot checks for violations. According to the accident driver's supervisor, there were no reports from coworkers of abuse of the cell phone policy by the accident driver and the supervisor had not reviewed any of the accident driver's videos. Uber ATG's lack of safety culture led to conditions in including the inadequate oversight of vehicle operators that enabled the driver to violate company cell phone policy and experience extended periods of distraction. Now we'll discuss the changes that were implemented post-crash. Uber ATG ceased all testing operations immediately after the crash to evaluate its testing and overhaul its operational and organizational procedures. Additionally, Uber ATG conducted an internal review and hired an outside consultant firm to conduct an external safety review. On December 20th, 2018, Uber ATG resumed ADS testing operations and implemented new operational changes. Some of the new procedures included, testing operations were now limited to a one mile loop in Pittsburgh near the ATG headquarters, and test vehicles were reduced from 45 miles per hour to 25 miles per hour. Uber ATG also reinstated the second vehicle operator and reclassified all vehicle operators as mission specialists and received new enhanced driver training. Uber ATG also installed new inward-facing cameras that would allow for real-time monitoring of operator attentiveness. Both the internal and external reviews identified issues and made several recommendations. Some of the recommendations included develop a safety management system and hire individuals with SMS expertise. 
Additionally, it was recommended to appoint senior managers to operational safety and training of operators. It was also recommended the company designate a head of safety to lead SMS. The reviews also made recommendations to make safety improvements to the ADS system, which was mentioned by Dr. Beshish in the previous presentation. As a result of the external review, Uber ATG made numerous changes to the company's organization to implement a new corporate safety culture. For example, the company created an independent safety department and moved its training and operational safety teams into the safety department. Uber ATG also hired two senior safety professionals with over 20 years experience with SMS expertise. Uber ATG also implemented new policies and procedures for hiring drivers, as well as new advanced training requirements for both staff and drivers. New procedures were also implemented for drug testing requirements and all policies were updated to be standalone policies that must be acknowledged by the driver. Lastly, Uber ATG implemented a new fatigue management program that was modeled after the North American Fatigue Management Program. There are several models that explain safety culture. The International Civil Aviation Organization, or ICAO, for example, offers guidance on SMS implementation. This model acknowledges the need for four basic components or pillars of, cult of safety culture. Those four elements include, number one, safety policy, which is how we do things. Number two, safety risk management, how we identify, hazards, and assess risk. Number three, safety assurance, how we monitor organizational performance. And number four, safety promotion, how we encourage safety throughout the company. Implementing an SMS program in an organization could take several years to fully integrate. While the NTSB is encouraged to see the positive organizational and operational changes at Uber ATG, these changes will take years to fully implement. It is important that Uber ATG fully embrace the four pillars of SMS, and that is why staff is proposing a recommendation in this issue area. In summary, this investigation determined that at the time of the crash, Uber ATG was lacking basic elements to support a strong safety culture. These weaknesses included inadequate driver oversight which led to conditions that enabled the driver to violate the company's cell phone policy. Uber ATG conducted extensive internal and external safety reviews that identified safety deficiencies. Uber ATG has made significant progress to remedy these deficiencies by overhauling the organization, hiring new key safety personnel, updating their policies and procedures in their operations, and initiating a safety management system. This concludes my presentation. Dr. Beshish has the final presentation, which he will discuss the testing of automated vehicles. Good afternoon. In this presentation, I will discuss the relevant federal guidance and the lack of requirements pertaining to vehicles equipped with automated driving systems applicable to either production or test level vehicles. I will also discuss the requirements that were and are currently in the place in Arizona where the crash occurred. And for a comparison, the policies from Pennsylvania and California, which have more extensive requirements. The promise of automated vehicles is that they will reduce the number of crashes and will be safer than a human driver. Until this promise is reached, the testing of these systems, among other settings, also occurs on public roads. As staff has discussed earlier, developmental ADS have considerable limitations and will err during testing. To safeguard the public while testing on public roads, it is crucial to have appropriate risk management mechanisms in place and the framework structure to assess those mechanisms. There are no current standards or any assessment protocols for ADS. As already discussed by Mr. Pereira, the Uber ATG test vehicle met all the FMVSS. 
While there are no standards pertaining to ADS, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has developed some guidance for such systems. They came out in NHTSA's Automated Vehicles Policy. The last version of the policy was published in October of 2018. The guidance states that it applies to both production and test level systems, and it contains 12 safety relevant elements. The guidance in these safety areas is rather cursory. For example, in one of the areas, the policy makes a suggestion to manufacturers to, quote, consider whether it is reasonable and appropriate to incorporate driver engagement monitoring. As we have seen in this investigation, driver engagement monitoring is crucial. Moreover, the guidance does not contain metrics that ADS developers can use to determine whether they have achieved the safety goals. Additionally, in the policy, NHTSA encourages ADS developers to submit a safety self-assessment report based on these safety areas. However, the submission of this report is not mandatory. The agency has received only 16 such reports. For a comparison, there are 62 developers testing in California only. Also, NHTSA does not provide evaluation of the submitted reports. This has resulted in the great variability of the reports received in terms of the content and detail they include. In the first iteration of the AV policy, NHTSA stated that it may in the future require the submission of the safety self-assessment reports. Mandating the submission of the reports and providing an appropriate assessment and approval would provide a minimum safeguard for testing on public roads. Since there are no performance protocols or appropriate metrics for evaluating the performance, it would be necessary to take a holistic view of an organization's safety culture to assess the developer's adequacy of risk management. The type of the assessment that staff has already discussed in regards to Uber ATG. Staff has proposed recommendations that reflect these areas of improvement in federal approach. In the absence of federal standards or adequate federal guidance, some states have started developing legislation and policies pertaining to ADS testing out of concern for testing on public roads. This lack of appropriate framework for ADS testing could be attributed to limitations of a traditional division of oversight in which NHTSA regulates the vehicle and the states regulate the driver. This division may not apply to developmental ADS, as it is frequently unclear who controls the vehicle, the system, or the human, or whether the control is shared. Also, there is an increased risk of ADS testing due to automation complacency, as staff discussed earlier. At the time of the crash, Arizona operated under an executive order which required developers testing without a human operator inside the vehicle to submit a statement acknowledging that the system can meet a few requirements. However, developers testing with an operator inside the vehicle were not required to submit such statements or meet any other conditions that do not also apply to non-automated vehicles. As such, Uber ATG was not required to submit such statement. While well, Arizona DOT, at the instruction of the governor, had removed Uber ATG's privileges for testing after this crash, the state has not expanded the requirements for testing. Developers testing with an operator inside the vehicle are still not subject to any special requirements. As of summer of this year, 29 states had some type of ADS-related legislation or policy. However, these policies vary greatly, and some don't include any testing-related components. Pennsylvania is the state where Uber ATG is currently conducting testing. Pennsylvania has a specific policy for ADS testing, which includes an application process. The state has established a task force that conducts comprehensive review of testing applications, which includes seeking clarifications or additional requirements prior to testing a granting, granting a testing permit. 
The application also requires specialized training of vehicle operators and considerations for operator inattentiveness. Further, Pennsylvania does not allow testing without a human operator inside a vehicle. However, the application process is not mandatory. Still, all the developers testing in the state at this time have gone through the application process and have received a permit. Like Pennsylvania, California has also established a task force that conducts comprehensive review of testing applications. California also requires specialized training of vehicle operators and considerations for operator inattentiveness. Further, California requires regular submission of incident reports, including the frequency of ADS disengagements. Unlike Pennsylvania, California does allow testing without a human operator inside a vehicle. However, the state has significant requirements for such testing, and currently, all the developers in California test with a human operator inside the test vehicle. There are several steps that Arizona and other states can take to safeguard the public when various entities conduct ADS testing on public roads. Having a mandatory application process for testing that includes a comprehensive review by an appropriate task force would be a critical component. This review should examine the tester's plan for risk mitigation associated with crashes and operator inattentiveness due to automation complacency. Any countermeasures included with risk management strategies should be appropriate for the parameters at which the systems are being tested, such as the environment. Staff has proposed recommendations that reflect these areas of improvement. In summary, the challenge of full vehicle automation has not yet been solved. Due to their current limitations, developmental ADS carry a risk when being tested on public roads. To safely reach the promise of automated vehicles, both federal and state actions are needed to develop processes to examine the appropriateness of risk mitigation strategies when testing. Finally, the information that staff has presented about this investigation reflects the complexity of testing and the organizational structure and oversight support such testing requires. This concludes staff's presentation. We are now prepared to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, tell you what, why don't we take a 10 minute break. Let's come back well, by that clock. Let's come back at uh, 2.35 where uh, we are in recess.
will begin here very shortly, please. Okay, we're back in session. Thank you for the break, and uh, we'll begin with questions from the Vice Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Simwalt. We've been having uh, a lot of discussion here on the board uh, regarding automation uh, in aviation and some of the challenges that have been going on in that area. And uh, in, in aviation, obviously, uh, we've been working at it for about 70 or 80 years. Um, I notice in the report we bring up the term automation complacency, which I think is a, a, a really good uh, description uh, that needs to be into everybody's vocabulary. Um, Dr. Marshall, could you discuss for us a little bit what you mean by automation complacency? Automation complacency describes a situation where we have an operator who's tasked with monitoring the uh, performance of an automated system. And maybe due to the reliability of the system becomes less vigilant, which allows for um, errors to develop in the system. And how does that uh, manifest itself? In terms of the, the human, obviously the system is doing whatever it's doing and misbehaving whenever it misbehaves, rarely. Right. Uh, it could actually manifest itself in, in, um, in a few ways. Um, one is that the operator would lose vigilance, uh, not do his or her task uh, sufficiently. Um, another, as in the case of uh, this crash was uh, an operator who intentionally um, de uh, decided not to um, be vigilant in her task. And so it, it could occur as, um, it could occur intentionally or unintentionally. And as you mentioned, automation complacency has been seen in pretty much all modes of transportation. Anytime that uh, a task has been automated and uh, the operator's uh, um, task has been has been um, made more of a monitor, um, and but that's not the only place it's been seen. We've we've seen it in, in uh, robotics, and we've seen it in um, um, advancements in med in medicine as well. So it's it's been seen in a lot of places. How should uh, how should we guard against it? Well. It, um, it's interesting because automation complacency um, is, is a pretty robust thing. It, you know, it's, it's hard to be trained away from it. Um, it's, it's seen um, in uh, novice operators as well as experienced operators. But I think one, one thing that can be done is to strengthen um, safety management systems. Um, in the case of Uber, uh, or Uber ATG, uh, a few things that they've implemented recently uh, should help in that case. Um, one is um, more robust um, oversight of the driver. They've actually uh, contracted with a third party to, um, to do a video oversight of the driver um, where, the, where the, uh, they could actually do spot checks on the driver. Another thing that they've done, which should actually also reduce automation complacency is brought back the second vehicle operator. That way we've got eyes, more eyes on the road, but we also have eyes on each other in, the, in that case. And another thing that they've done is also they've changed their, um, their scheduling practices. Before, uh, uh, vehicle operators were able to operate for as much as four and a half hours before taking a break. 
now that's been reduced to two hours. So I think all of these things and a stronger SMS uh, should help with this. And one of the things uh, on the aviation side that we've looked at, because again, we have uh, lots of automation in, in our aircraft, ranging from small airplanes all the way up to large ones, uh, is that there is a, a monitoring system, air traffic control that's sort of watching what's going on. That's not 100%, but it certainly helps. And uh, for the controllers themselves, shorter shift periods. So a controller uh, will, will be rotated out uh, on a pretty regular basis and uh, at the uh, terminal uh, facilities they'll rotate between being up in the control tower and then down watching the radar so they're getting some variety in the whole system. Um, I think this, this whole concept of complacency uh, across the board is hugely important in all modes of transportation and I want to commend uh, the Department of Highway Safety for introducing it into our vocabulary. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's mm -hmm. member Hammond. No, I was thinking. No, he was thinking he was <laughs> going to say something. I was, well. uh, but I won't. But uh, no, we've, we've heard of automation complacency before. But, yes, uh, we have. But yeah. OK, thank you. Skip. Member Hamadi. OK. Um, can you put up slide six for a second? Um, and this is the crash scene. And what I want to ask about is the median area. And the original design of the median actually looks like a path to me. So and I'm sure is that how it looked? When you were on scene? Yes, it does, Member Harvey. OK. And could you see at night no pedestrian signs? Were there any? Yes, there were, there was, there were several no pedestrian signs. So we do agree with you. It does look like a. Uh, it does look like a path. Because yes. if you look at across, yes, it's not an intersection and it's not in a crosswalk. But if you, if you look across the street, you've got. On, actually, on both sides of the street, sidewalks. So this looks like a path that, if you were jaywalking, you might go across to get to the other side. So I'm, and I understand that Tempe took some actions afterwards to change some things on that path. So it 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 now looks a, and probably feels a little bit different. But I think local cities have to take that into account when they're putting when they have infrastructure um, that they. Um, <laughs> are putting up. So it, it, how far were the crosswalks? You said 380 feet to the north. How far from the south? What, if you can bring up a slide. We have, we have a slide. I can show you this. Yeah, so there you go. I mean, if you put that one back, that really does look like a path. Yeah. Not that one. Yep. I yeah, mean, that, that's the median at the time of the crash. It's approximately 2,800 feet. 2,800 feet to the south. Yeah, if so, ma'am, on, on this one, I, I apologize. On this one here, shown in the red circles okay. are the, um, the crosswalk, and the yellow is our area of impact where the crash occurred. And the reason why I'm asking this is because I'm, I'm very sensitive to victim blaming. And, you know, we say a number of times in this report that the pedestrian's decision to cross in front of an approaching vehicle was likely due to diminished perception and judgment resulting from drug use. How do we know that, Dr. McKay? And the reason why I'm asking that is because, I mean, it does look like a path. The individual was walking her bicycle across the street. It had, she had a light on the, on the bicycle. So how do we know that that it was likely due to diminished perception and judgment resulting from drug use. So we don't know that her decision to cross the street there was related to drug use. What we do know is that she had a very high level of methamphetamine in her body post-mortem. More than 10 times the dose if you were taking it medicinally. What we don't know is whether her level was going up and she was high or it was coming down and she was beginning to crave more drug. The level itself, the number, doesn't tell us what the effect was directly on her. So she may have been euphoric and grandiose and thought that she could stop the vehicle with her hand. She may have been coming down and been 
feeling unwell, feeling I just want to get to the other side, and I don't care if something happens to me. So it's not her decision to cross the road mid-block, which clearly lots of pedestrians do. It's also her inability to evade the clearly visible oncoming car. So it's the level of the drug which suggests misuse, abuse, and, uh, and her inability to manage the situation which could have been managed safely. Um, does anyone know why Tempe was selected as a test location? Ma'am, Arizona has a large history of vehicle testing, but large manufacturers also use the Tempe area. And we don't have a specific reason why Tempe, why Uber selected Tempe, but other manufacturers of development of AV vehicles use it because of the weather. It's, they can test year round, weather conditions, they can go out in the desert. But one of the areas we also looked at, it could have been also Arizona's possible, their, uh, their AV policy which brought them in there also. The, Sorry, I didn't hear you. It, it's, there, uh, let, let Enzar finish that one for you, please. Just to add, uh, Mr. Pereira is correct. Uh, we may infer various reasons for developers testing that consistent weather, including sunny, is certainly an important factor. Arizona uh, testing policy may play a role uh, during our investigations, we have identified the deficiencies in that policy that we believe led to the crash, which is why staff has proposed a recommendation directly to Arizona. Okay, I'm out of time, but I am going to come back to this issue in the next round. What? I got one more coffee for this table. No. <laughs> That's true. Dr. Poland, uh, I think this is a really good report. One of the things that we're all sensitive to is the amount of time that it's taking us to complete investigations. And somebody could look at this and say, well, gosh, the accident, the, the, the event was, the crash was, was uh, March of 2018. So it's been 20 months. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of reasons uh, why it's probably taken longer because I think the public needs to understand that we don't operate in a vacuum here. Um, five days earlier, uh, there was the Florida International University bridge collapse, which was investigated by the Office of Highway Safety. Um, a few days later, we had a Tempe crash, I'm sorry, a Tesla crash in Mountain View, California. Seven months after this, we had Schoharie limousine, which was a horrible crash that killed 20 people, which is in your camp. And then we also had this thing, a very unfortunate thing called a five weeks of government shutdown. So plus, it takes a while to do a report and do it well. Are there any, I think it's important that the public understand sometimes why things can take the amount of time that they do. Any, any comments about that? No, you're, you're certainly correct. I think the Office of Highway Safety has had opportunities to investigate some crashes and specifically the, the bridge collapse as well, where the NTSB can be very influential and, and share our safety perspective with a broad group. I think... This, I agree with you that this is an excellent report, and certainly we believe that draft recommendations will be very influential. We also believe that the draft report can serve as a good case study for what happened in this crash. We feel as though, although the report does take the NTSB time to come forward, through our ability to work with the parties throughout the investigation, there's certainly opportunities, especially in this emerging technology field, and through that party process for developers to be able to take safety action early on in an investigation, and by working collaborative, collaboratively with our staff, then we feel as though even though that time may be a long duration, that, that they certainly are able to participate in that fact-finding and um, fact-gathering phase and implement safety changes that are based on, on our wealth of perspective from safety management systems to safety cultures, as well as many other aspects. Yeah, and I remember you're saying fairly early on that this 
investigation has the ability to have far-reaching uh, implications uh, down the road. So uh, thank you. And by the way, everybody knows that my math is not good. It was 19 months, not, not 20. So I can ask you, Dr. Poland, or you, Mr. Pereira, um, as far as a party is concerned, how, was, uh, how did you find Uber to be in terms of a party to the investigation? Sir, from day one, I think Uber, they embraced the party system. They, uh, they were transparent, they were cooperative. Uh, the, it was, uh, they provide information, making us sure that we understood their internal pro process. And our communication with them became an open dialogue, which afforded them the opportunity to take that dialogue. And, and we worked just to, it was, uh, afforded them the opportunity to make the improvements early in the investigation. So right from day one, they started listening. We had that communication. We had the channels going, and they were making the changes as we were going. And they, so again, they're an example how the party system is supposed to work, sir. Yeah, I did notice that uh, when I talked to their CEO, he did not uh, hang up on me. Um, but I remember also during this process, um, uh, we were dealing with another automobile manufacturer who wasn't necessarily following the rules an advanced sort of an automatic, an advanced automobile dealer, dealer um, manufacturer, and you would say, and Chris would say, but 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 Uber really wants to follow the rules, and they're wondering how this other organization is doing those things, and that's why we had to remove that other organization from from a party. So I appreciate the uh, the way that Uber has been a good party. Plus, we'll talk about some of the safety enhancements that they've really embraced as a result of this. It'd be easy just to thumb it off, blow it off, say, NTSB, they're wrong, they're bad, and hang up on us. Um, but Uber has not done that. So uh, thank you very much. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, when we look at crashes, that there's never a single aspect to these things. It's always a series of events. Um, Member Hominy just briefly touched on the infrastructure. Um, is it somewhat unusual to have signs in between crosswalks that say, don't cross here? I can see this was a good question. <laughs> no crash history. <laughs> Can you repeat that, please, <laughs> Vice Chairman? <laughs> I apologize. I realize it's after lunch, it's tough, but. And it's uh, cold. Is, is it unusual for there to be signs in between crosswalks that say, don't cross here? I'm getting at infrastructure, and, and as I say, Member Hammond, you sort of touched on it. Uh, so I liked some of the things that, they, uh, that Tempe did. So what Tempe did with that median, just following up with Member Hamidi, was that they added the, pro the prohibited pedestrian crossing signs. They doubled them. They took out that brick area, and they put river rock. They put more vegetation in. So with that, and again, we also, the, the legal crosswalk is 350 feet away. Yeah, so the only thing but, we're missing is rattlesnakes. Rattlesnakes, yeah. yes. It seems to me, and just looking at this, and this is, of course, our hindsight bias, that if you wanted to, people could still get to the midpoint with just ignoring the signs. And obviously, we know that, that sign, signage does not appear to be particularly effective, uh, particularly for people who might be somewhat impaired, as Dr. McKay has, uh, I think, mentioned. Would it have made better sense for them to put up some kind of physical barrier, such as fencing? Uh, along on both sides of the road, uh, as opposed to allowing them to get halfway across and then figure out that maybe I can't get any farther? Well, sir, we looked at that. They would just go further down the road and cross the roadway at another area, mid-block. But something else that we did too, sir, we looked at the crash data. We examined the crash rate for the last 10 years in that area, and we found there was no other fatal pedestrian crashes occurred in that area, any. So also, we did a pedestrian count in that area in June of 2018. 
And the, the numbers are, are kind of skewed because there was a concert going on in the area at the same time. So we did 24 hours of pedestrians, and we found that 66 pedestrians and 12 bicyclists crossed that North Mill area during that time frame, which comes up to about 2.5 pedestrians an hour in the same area. But again, we have to take into account that there was a concert that night. We also spoke to law enforcement. We talked to uh, an officer that patrolled that area for the last 20 years. He doesn't recall any other pedestrian crashes. We also contacted the uh, city of Tempe following the crash, see if there's any updated crash information. There hasn't been a pedestrian strike there since then. Infrastructure challenges aren't necessarily unique to this location in Tempe. The, um, the Office of Highway Safety brought a report forward to the board, as you know, last year talking about pedestrian safety. And one of the aspects that we looked at was infrastructure challenges mm -hmm. and ways that the infrastructure can be designed to support pedestrian safety. And so there's a lot of aspects in that report, as well as 15 investigations looking at various aspects, including infrastructure design, as well as some aspects to enhance the vehicle safety, which are some components that are brought out in this report too, because we know there are opportunities for whatever reason where we will have hazards in the roadway, whether it's a human driving the vehicle or whether it's an automated driving system. Yeah, Those I, systems I have to of, have controls in place. Yeah, one of the other things, and, and this is probably not a popular statement, but I think pedestrians have a responsibility, anybody that's walking close to a, a roadway, to be aware, not distracted, not impaired, and certainly there's, there's enough responsibility here to go around on, on all sides. But uh, I think one of the messages, and I think this came out in our pedestrian report as well, is that uh, if someone is not paying attention to their environment, whether they're walking or whether they're driving, uh, you can expect a bad outcome. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and of course, that's why the draft report has recommendations looking at these safety risks. We know that our public roads have numerous safety risks, and that has to be part of a risk assessment, a risk evaluation of these automated driving systems. Thank you, Vice Chairman, and Member Hominy. I, I would agree. Um, it does have to be taken into consideration in risk analysis, and I think there was some data that was available at the time that Uber or ATG didn't use. Um, I look, in a recent article based on 2016 data from the Arizona Governor's Office of Highway Safety, 72% of the pedestrian-related vehicular incidents in Arizona happened away from an intersection or jaywalking. In 2017, 21.6% of the fatalities in Arizona were pedestrians. In fact, it's one of the highest in the country, and just outside Tempe is Phoenix, which has the highest pedestrian fatality rate per 100,000 in the country. So was Uber aware of these statistics when uh, they determined where they were going to do testing? And I know you said that uh, it could be partially because of the weather, but partially because of lack of regulation. And I am gonna get into that later on in this, uh, um, maybe not in this round, but in the next one. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, I cannot speak to whether ATG was familiar with those specific Arizona statistics. Um, one part of the training of vehicle operators included anticipating jaywalkers. And that was done on the closed course testing in Pittsburgh, where they would have scenarios where they might have motorized uh, pedestrians jump in front, and they were trained to do so. Uh, the vehicle operator's task was to take control of the vehicle in any emergency situations such as, such as those. When we interviewed uh, 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 other vehicle operators, they stated that about half percent of the time the system would correctly respond to jaywalking pedestrians, but at other times the system would not and the operators would have to take control of the vehicle. And that is really expected challenge of, of testing of these systems that have pretty limited perception. Well, and at the time of this crash, the ATG automated driving system did not have the functionality to anticipate pedestrians crossing mid-block outside a marked crosswalk. 
pedestrians clearly should have been an anticipated safety risk. So um, I'm just, it, it, and it, it, why didn't it have the functionality? It's a little more, uh, the answer is a little bit more complicated, but I'll try to express it yeah. uh, succinctly. At the time of the crash, the ADS could detect pedestrians, but would not uh, give them an inherent goal of jaywalking. If the system had the pedestrian's consistent tracking history and consistent classification as such, it could then predict the path of jaywalking. The issue in this crash was that the system was never able to correctly classify the pedestrian as such because of the challenges of machine perception, perhaps due to pedestrian walking a bicycle and then confusing the system. Uh, Post-crash, Uber has made changes in many of these areas, including how it uh, predicts a path and also could assign a specific goal to a pedestrian to jaywalk without other factors and in taking into account. Uh, the Volvo's uh, forward collision warding and automatic emergency braking systems were disabled, correct? Correct. Why? Why? The, uh, like we, in our presentation, ma'am, the, uh, there was a radar, there was a confliction with the radar systems. So it, if it wasn't disabled, that could have prevented the crash, correct? That's correct, ma'am. The, the uh, Volvo ran some simulation tests for us during, they are part of the party system also. Is, and they did 20 variations of the testing. The variations were that they, they varied the, uh, the speed of the pedestrian and her angle. And out of those 20, 17 out of 20, the uh, crash was avoided. And the other three, they were mitigated that the vehicle would be at less than 10 miles an hour. We also had Thassum Research did an independent study, uh, the United Kingdom, and they actually did a closed course test where they tested the... Uh, Similar conditions, same they're not the same vehicle, but they use a Volvo XC90. They had a they had a pedestrian uh, dummy with a bicycle, and so they simulated the same crash scenario. And again, it avoided the striking the dummy. Or on several of the tests, they significantly reduced the vehicle speed prior to in fact mitigate the collision. How did Uber uh, address this after the crash? After the crash. We don't know the internal. They uh, worked with Volvo, mm -hmm. and uh, the system is now active during testing. Okay. I mean, so it could have been done pre-crash, because it's now been done post-crash. Uh, we were uh, been discussing with uh, both ATG and Volvo, uh, our understanding that engineers from the both team uh, met to figure out the challenge, how to get both systems activated at the same time. That was the challenge initially, that they couldn't both be activated at the same time without conflicting information. From the technical perspective, exactly how they solved this problem to be able to, uh, I know that they changed frequency at which the uh, ATG radars operate, but beyond that, I couldn't provide additional explanation on exactly what the technical challenges were. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Member Hamadi. But the gist of, of what this conversation was just about is that the system, the collision avoidance capabilities or the collision avoidance abilities of the automatic driving system were below those of the system that it replaced Then the factory installed uh, AEB and uh, forward collision mooring systems. Is that correct? Uh, they had a uh, lower maximum braking force, correct? Yeah. So go back through the notion that you were talking about, uh, Mr. Becic, um, about, uh, I was thinking in the report itself, and I have a, a note here to that effect, that... Um, it said that the system did not include logic for jaywalking pedestrians. But I think what you were saying with Member Hamadi is that's not entirely correct. But that I, I wrote that note out of page 26 of the report. 
Um, if this system, as I recall, so it detected, it detected the object, it was, and I'll probably get the order wrong here, a vehicle, a pedestrian, and then other. And, and, and so it didn't have time to then com compute the goal. Is that basically correct? Uh, goals are, are sort of assigned kind of initial goal of, of, a, of an object that is detected. And then additional factors are incorporated to determine it is, its intent, where it is going, such as where it was coming from. Um, and, but in this case, actually, the system was never able to identify the object as a pedestrian. It viewed it as, a, as an unknown, as a vehicle, as a bicycle, which uh, at the time the system also had, when it would change the classification at, uh, of an object, it essentially kind of viewed it as a somewhat of a new object because it would lose its tracking history. So the complexities of the system were present, which is one of the reasons why vehicle operator was charged as the final countermeasure, which uh, there were issues here. But the uh, post-crash Uber has made really changes in all of these areas in terms of how the system determines the path of, of a hazard. All right, so let me make sure I understand this. If the system had, had, had classified this object, this, this person, as, as a person, then would it have properly tracked and tr tracked her and prevented the, the crash? It wasn't so much the fact that she was jaywalking, it was more that, that it couldn't figure out whether it was a vehicle, a person, a bicycle, or another object. If it would have zeroed in on the fact that she was a person, could it then, even, even a jaywalking person, could it have, could it have properly uh, stopped the automobile or caused a, 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 a swerving action to have avoided the collision? Based on the logic uh, uh, of the system at the time of the crash, if it was able to consistently view the object as a pedestrian, it would be able to give it predicted and accurate path of jaywalking. Yeah, so it wasn't so much that the system wasn't capable of, of uh, uh, having logic for a jaywalking pedestrian, it's just that the, the system was having trouble figuring out what it was. Is that correct? That would be correct. Okay. My opinion. Uh, thank you. Um, well, it would have stopped. My point. Yeah. You know, I, I like to think in terms of redundancy, and um, and we, we, we like redundancy so that if one layer of defense uh, prevents, if one layer of defense fails, then you still have other layers of defense. And so uh, here, some of the vehicle redundant, some of the redundancy of the vehicle was removed. That uh, that 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 uh, that that Uber ATG had removed or disabled while the automatic driving system was was in operation, they had disabled the Volvo forward collision warning system and the AEB. So there's one level of redundancy that was removed there. From the human uh, perspective, uh, I think that uh, Uber ATG took, they used to have two people in the vehicle, they removed one, so you've lost a layer of redundancy there. And then for the one single point that was in the vehicle, they were not regularly monitoring the operations of that single person. Does that pretty well sum, sum it up right there? Very well. Thank you very much, Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What is uh, NHTSA's role in managing um, this automation testing on public highways? My apologies, could you repeat the question? I'm having a problem here this afternoon. <laughs> what is NHTSA's role in managing automation on the public highways? Testing, believe, automation testing. I understand. Uh, we believe that the traditional division of oversight doesn't really apply well to developmental ADS and their testing. And we believe that both uh, federal government, NHTSA, and the states have a role in ensuring safe testing on public roads in, in addition to the developers having appropriate safety culture. Uh, NHTSA is perfectly positioned due to the AV policy guidance to provide an initial level, level of assessment of whether developer, of developers' safety testing. Have they done that? 
Uh, NHTSA has provided guidance in terms of the AV policy and has made a suggestion that developers should submit. But it's submit. not mandatory. It is voluntary, it is not mandatory, and more importantly, NHTSA does not have a process to assess those reports. How easy it for, is it for a manufacturer to figure out what they're going to do, or do they cherry pick which state they go to? Uh, I would rather not speculate in terms of the where, how the developers make decision as to where to uh, test, but the lack of the initial basic assessment by NHTSA, which they are in position to provide, also removes a, an important tool for states to determine whether it is sufficient to grant uh, a developer a testing permit to test in their state. Do the states have the expertise to do this? Pencil, uh, so we talk, uh, we met with Pennsylvania DOT to learn about their policy, and we learned that the learned it was highly influenced by the Tempe crash and the lessons that they have learned, and they have uh, really started the their kind of committee or task force uh, from bottom up within a DOT and they received the support from the governor's office to develop a policy that would learn from the lessons from the Tempe crash and develop an application process and a truly evaluative process that, that communicates so with So Pennsylvania developers. is learning. Is NHTSA learning? We I, I are realize hoping, I'm putting we, you into a we, difficult situation. We are situation. hoping that they would, through our pro step, proposed recommendation to NHTSA to, uh, provide, to provide this an ex excellent tool of initial assessment. So, um, just yeah, following yeah. along, and I'm sorry. Sorry, go ahead. sorry. Um, we, we feel like there's some critical recommendations dealing with highly automated vehicles in this report. The NTSB also has a report dealing with Williston, Florida, dealing with a lower level of automation, a, a partial automation system. And in that report, we made other recommendations to NHTSA that we feel uh, as though they're low hanging fruit. And the federal government certainly has the ability to implement those as well. Some of those recommendations are critical to those lower levels of automation, but also to higher levels of automation, specifically event data recorders, as well as limiting the operation of the systems to within their operational design domain. So there's some critical areas that we think certainly are feasible for the federal government to have some role in that area, in addition to the proposed recommendations that we have here today. Is anybody collecting data on this? I mean, this shouldn't be dependent upon, you know, opinion. We should have factual information on, you know, not big crashes like, like this one where there's a fatality, but even smaller ones, which oftentimes it's just a matter of luck as to whether somebody would get killed or not or, or damage. So I'm, I'm curious as to the data collection capabilities here. Uh, based on the, on, uh, if we are staying with the Tempe crash and our evaluation of developmental ADS, one of the requirements at California uh, is to, for developers to provide regular reports on any incidents and also reports on frequency of disengagements of ADS, although the extent to which that one is, is yeah, um, relevant is questionable, but we have uh, issued uh, numerous recommendations you know, previously in our Williston crash that Dr. Poland can uh, discuss. But, it, but as of now, there is no centralized or requirement to gather this information so everybody can be informed on a factual basis. It may differ from state to state for the testing that is, but there is no uh, uh, federal, on the federal level, it does not exist. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Member Holland. And uh, just to circle back uh, on what you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, uh, on page 67, I mean, it, it does say that uh, the technology could anticipate pedestrians in a marked crosswalk, but not outside that in mid-block. So clearly there was some problem with um, detecting jaywalkers. So. I, w I do want to add on to what um, the vice chairman was getting at, and I want to read you, um, first of all, I want to state 36,560 is the number of deaths on our nation's roadways from 2018. 
It went down slightly, but certainly not something to celebrate. 36,560. So I want to uh, read you a line from a publication August 2018 from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. A patchwork of state laws and voluntary federal guidelines is attempting to cover the testing and eventual deployment of autonomous vehicles in the US. It is a decidedly pro-technology approach that lacks adequate safeguards to protect other road users. Do you agree, Dr. Poland, yes or no? The Just a yes or no. Does, it have, does the federal policy have adequate safety guards? No. Exactly. So does anyone know what NHTSA's mission is? NHTSA's mission, and I'm from their website, is to save lives first and foremost, prevent injuries, and reduce economic costs due to road traffic crashes through education research safety standards which we are lacking here, and enforcement activity. But first and foremost, it's to save lives. In my opinion, they've put technology advancement here before saving lives. And I want to talk about the voluntary safety assessments. In their automated driving, it's, I guess this is 2.0 of their policy, called Automated Driving Systems, A Vision for Safety. They should rename it A Vision for Lax Safety. So in, on page 12, it says on voluntary safety assessments, this is actually laughable, Entities are not required to submit a voluntary safety self-assessment. This is in bold. Nor is there any mechanism to compel entities to do so. While these assessments are encouraged prior to testing and deployment, NHTSA does not require that entities provide disclosures, nor are they required to delay testing or deployment. Assessments are not subject to federal approval. I mean, you might as well say, we would like your assessments, but we're really not requiring it, so why do it? So this is, and they, they do actually restate it in bold on page 16, so in the same document. The guidance also contains 12 safety goals and approaches that could be used to achieve those safety goals. That's, what it, that's a quote. But there are no requirements and very little information provided on how manufacturers should achieve those goals. That's what we state in our report. So let me go briefly over, I have a minute and 36 seconds. I'll ho I hope the chairman will give me a little bit more time here. They have 12 safety goals. Number one, system safety. Entities are encouraged to follow a robust design and validation process based on a systems engineering approach with the goal of designing ADSs free of unreasonable safety risks. That sounds great. The goal of it, they are encouraged. Two, operational design domain. Entities are encouraged to define and document where and when they can operate. Object and event detection and response is number three. The driver should be able, the driver or ADS should be able to detect any circumstance that is relevant to the immediate driving task, like other pedestrians or bicyclists. Four, fallback strategy. That's what they call it. Entities are encouraged to have a documented process for transitioning to a minimal risk condition when a problem is encountered or the ADS cannot operate safely. Five, validation measure, measure models. Entities are encouraged to develop validation methods to appropriately mitigate the safety risks. Six, this is on page 10. Human-machine interface entities are encouraged to consider whether it is reasonable or appropriate to incorporate driver engagement. And actually, on page 10, it says ADS should be capable of uh, determining when, whether there is a malfunction. I would hope so, but they're encouraged to do that. Uh, number seven, vehicle cybersecurity. Entities are encouraged to follow a robust product development process based on a systems engineering approach to minimize risks to safety, including cybersecurity threats. Crash worthiness. Entities should consider the possible scenario of another ve vehicle crashing into them. Duh. I would hope that is a requirement. Num number nine, post-crash ADS behavior. Entities engaged in testing or deployment should consider methods for returning ADS to a safe state immediately after a crash. 
like moving the vehicle to a safe position off the roadway. Number 10, data recording, need data. Consumer education and training is number 11, and 12, federal, state, and local laws. So we are asking, so we're asking NISTA to make these safety assessments uh, mandatory. I would state, this is guidance. I wrote laws for 14 and a, over 14 years. There is a big difference between the words should encouraged to, and shall. And so I actually think that there is a major failing on the federal government's part and, and the state of Arizona, because they also didn't have any standards in place and still don't, for failing to regulate these operations. And I am gonna come back to that in the next round because I'm well over a minute. Member Hamidi, thank you. May I see the cover page of that? Uh, because they're up to version three of this now, I believe. Yeah. And has version three significantly it's changed? It's, yeah. multi, it's focused on multimodal. The other modes. Thanks. That, that was uh, what I was wondering there, if yeah. version three uh, strengthened some of those. Thank you. So... I think it was the vice chairman that talked about, well, he definitely talked about automation complacency, and, and certainly we've seen that, in, as you mentioned, uh, in all modes of transportation. Um, and, and one of the methods that was mentioned was sort of an after-the-fact way of checking for automation complacency, and that is monitoring your drivers through the video r retrospectively, going back and seeing how they're doing yesterday or a month ago. But, but is it there, and we've talked about this before, aren't there devices that, that, that we specific, we usually think of it in terms of fatigue management, but uh, basically sort of eye tracking devices that can, that can monitor alertness, is that correct? Yes, yes, Mr. Chairman. And, and Uber, ha, Uber ATG has installed these inward facing cameras that do monitor for driver alertness. And is it monitoring in the sense that I'm talking about, that it's, it's an active system, it's not just a feed, a, a, a video feed back to a supervisor to see if somebody is complacent? It, would it actually alert if the driver is looking down for 23 seconds or something? Yes, sir, it would. Okay, good. What, auto, what level, using the SAE levels of automation, what level of automation would we have considered this vehicle to be in? Would it be level three maybe? Where would it be on the, on the spectrum? It is a little bit difficult to assess a developmental system, so which is why they're typically viewed as what the intent of the system is. And maybe the intent of the system is level four. Thank you very much. Let's talk about some of the things that Uber has done post-accident. Uh, systemic approach to improving a safety culture. There have been organizational changes, the, in, an independent safety department developing an SMS, and, and, and they're in the process of developing an SES, uh, SMS, realizing you're probably never really there. It's a continual thing. We are, through our recommendations, we are recommending that they continue that process. Uh, they are um, developing, uh, they're developed uh, operating monitoring practice like we, like we talked about. Uh, in addition to the active mode, the reactive retrospective mode of going back sort of like a flight operational quality assurance program to see how the vehicles are being operated, I believe. Uh, adherence to their drug testing program, fatigue management program, uh, technological change to the actual hardware, the, the, drive, the ADS itself. Uber ATG has made many of these changes uh, from this tragic accident, but what we want is operators to make these changes before an accident, and and that's really why we're here today. We can't we can't we can't go back and prevent what happened on March the 18th of last year, but what we can do is moving forward make the system safer. Because I said a few weeks ago, good risk management is good safety. And that's what we're, what this is about, is managing risk to an acceptable level. I, I think that's a, a definition that I use for safety, is what is safety? 
It's a process, it's an active thing where we're constantly seeking things that can bite you and manage, managing those to an acceptable level. Um, so, um, what more does Uber need to, well, not just Uber, let's not talk about Uber, what more needs to be done to ensure the testing of ADS? We view it as a th really three-pronged approach. One, as you've discussed, uh, Uber and the rest of the industry has to have a good, sufficient safety culture and, and good enough risk mitigation mechanisms. But until we reach the uh, fully automated vehicles, until we get there, the risks of testing on public roads are real. And we also believe that the federal and the state governments do have significant roles to play in setting up uh, support structures to provide adequate oversight of developers testing on public roads. Thank you. You know, I, I did take good notes from what Member Hamidi said and how you answered it uh, with, with respect to the, uh, to the federal level. Uh, NHTSA needs to do, well, I wrote down provide guidance, but here we just heard that guidance is not enough. So what does, what does NHTSA need to do? Correct. Guidance is what NHTSA has now in the AV policy. And as we state, uh, only 16 developers have submitted the reports. And in terms of the content, they are kind of all over the place. Few of them provide good num amount of detail why others are frankly read like marketing brochures. So in, order, uh, in addition to making these reports submissions mandatory, to make them effective, NHTSA has to provide assessment of, of those reports, make a determination as to whether a developer has met the safety goals of those 12 uh, elements that, Mr., that Member Hamidi has just read. And I'll wrap it up on this, but I think you said previously that, uh, that NHTSA currently does not have a system to accept these, uh, these assessment reports. Is that correct? To, to evaluate. To, to evaluate. That. Currently, those 16 reports are on the NHTSA website. Great. Thank you very much, okay. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is, uh, I think, for uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Marcus. I'm looking for, um, I believe it was 2011 that NTSB made a recommendation to prevent the use of uh, non-driving and non-emergency use of personal electronic devices somewhere along that time. This is not something new uh, when a vehicle is in motion. Um, and we know that there is technology to prevent this from happening and we've been focused right now on you know, uh, uh, NHTSA's requirements, and we've talked about the automated vehicle, we've talked about the pedestrian, but the source of distraction, which allowed the driver to be complacent and, and distracted, was her cell phone. And we know right now, I, I would ask the audience, how many people are packing cell phones, and I would bet you every hand in the room would go up. There are just shy of a half a billion half a billion with a B cell phones in this country right now, and they are being used with great uh, uh, problem on the highways. So uh, have we seen any um, technology as far as trucking companies? Uh, how, how is this being managed, and is there something more that could be done in this area? That was a very long question. Uh, I, there's a question in there somewhere. I think uh, Dr. Marshall might actually be more familiar with the topic in, uh, I can always speak about what I don't know, but. Well, uh, our recommendation, to... but was it 2011 that we made that recommendation? Uh, um, I would Mark, like. Uh, I'll, I'll take the, I'll start with the question okay. and then we can pass it around because I think that you had a, probably several questions within there. So we'll, we'll start out with in 2011 we had the, um, a report on a crash that happened in Munfordville, Kentucky. And we did make a couple of recommendations. One was a recommendation to all the states to work on banning PED use, personal electronic device use, um, in all driving situations except in emergencies. And the other recommendation that came out of that was a recommendation to the associations 
um, two associations that deal with cellular telephones. Um, this was eight years ago, nine years ago when we were developing the recommendations. So um, times have changed a lot since then, I think. The technology has run rampantly forward. And most cell phones now, I believe, have technology, whether or not the, the user uses it, <laughs> it's a different That's story. That's the point. Yeah, so but I, the, I believe that the technology exists, it's just a matter of is the user going to turn it off silence it, do something so that that's not effective. Sometimes it can be very annoying when you're trying to use your Google map to navigate somewhere and it comes up and says, hey, you can't be on your phone. So <laughs> I think that well, gets frustrating. Well, but we made the distinction about non-driving kinds of things. Navigation, I would say, is, is useful. Mm -hmm. um, however, talking and texting, we have found, is, has been a problem. And right. one of the things, I think the studies, and you can correct me if I misspeak, but the studies have said that uh, once you take your eyes off the road for more than three seconds, the odds of having a crash go up significantly, and at seven seconds, they're something like 20 times more likely to have a crash. And what were we, 23 sec 29 seconds in this particular case? That's completely off the chart. So. Back to my original uh, observation of, you know, this has been since 2011, and where do we stand now? And uh, is anybody doing anything about this? So as you're pointing out, distraction is a huge problem. Member Hammond, you talked about the fatalities on our nation's roadways. That doesn't even account the crashes resulting in serious injuries. So obviously there's a huge problem, and distraction plays a large role in that problem. Which we saw in this crash. Correct. So we had a vehicle operator who was distracted. Interestingly, in Arizona, at the time of the crash, there was a law in place that would have prevented her from using this personal electronic device in this manner. We also know that Uber ATG had a cell phone policy. And in this report, we were focusing on the safety culture of the developer at this time in that they had a policy and they actually had a way of evaluating the driver, the vehicle operator, but did not choose to do that. Since that time, as we've heard from staff, they, they've made changes. The Office of Highway Safety is always looking at ways that we can address some of these major players whether it's impairment or distraction or seatbelt use, a lot of these aspects are major contributors to the fatalities that we see on our nation's roadways. And distraction, as I said, is a, is a major problem there. There's another report that staff is developing right now dealing with a crash that happened in California. And in that case, that is a driver driving their personal vehicle, unlike in this case where we have a vehicle operator being paid by a company to operate in a test Slightly environment. Slightly different environment. And, and staff is drafting some language where we think we can address the personal electronic device distraction in a much more impactful way. We're hoping to bring that to the board in, um, in February of 2020, so in the, in the very near future. We're hoping so that you'll see by. that. Yes, okay, please. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Vice Chairman, thank you. Member Hamadi. Thank you. Um, and it's not just, just to clarify, it's not just that NHTSA doesn't currently have a process to evaluate these voluntary safety assessments or self, safety self-assessments, is that they're also, they're not required. And so that's why they have 16 on their website, yet there are 62 entities that are registered in California. And like you said, some of these are more marketing materials than they are really getting into some of the issues uh, that uh, NHTSA and others want them to. And so there's no requirement, there's no evaluation, and you know, there's no real standards issued. And so one question I have is, can you briefly discuss the federal-state relationship when it comes to motor vehicle safety in general, and how that differs with autonomous vehicles? testing and deployment? So typically the relationship is that NHTSA regulates the vehicle itself. So all of the aspects dealing with the safety of the vehicle and the state is regulating the operation of the vehicle on its roadways. Traditionally, that would be within the state is the drivers. So the Department of Motor Vehicle licensing the drivers. 
So really what we're talking about here is a paradigm, sh paradigm shift where now we have the vehicle, as part of its vehicle design, where it is incorporating collision avoidance systems, all of the decisions, last minute crash avoidance, as well as how it's operating on, on our roadways. So that's driven at the vehicle level. And so that's a very different, different role. So staff has drafted some proposed recommendations that we think is that first step where the federal government can have the, that mandatory safety assessment and evaluate that, that ongoing evaluation. The state can then use that information along with how they operate on their states before they're issuing, how, how these vehicles are operating on their states before they're issuing a permit. So we think there definitely has to be a shift in how we're looking at advanced driving, automated driving systems. But we still think that there is a very large role for the federal government and the state governments to have during this, this testing in providing that minimum level of safety. Well, and from my view, there's also a problem with if you, if you have a void at the federal level, the states are going to need to fill that because they have to ensure safety of their citizens in their states. And, you know, I, I was looking also at the same NHTSA policy, which was issued in September 2017, and is still valid because the 3.0 is really focused on multimodal. Uh, and it, on page 18, it says regarding federal and state roles, the NHTSA strongly encourages states not to codify this voluntary guidance as a legal requirement for any phases of development, testing or deployment of ADSs, allowing NHTSA alone to regulate the safety design and performance aspects of ADS technology will help avoid conflicting federal and state laws and regulations that could impede deployment. So then my question is, it's 2019, it's the end of 2019, almost 2020, what federal regulations? Have they issued any federal regulations since this was issued on September 20th, 2017? No. Exactly. So some states are setting standards because they have to protect people. So some states are not, clearly. So let, can you talk a little bit about what California's done, what Pennsylvania's done? Arizona doesn't have anything right now. We hope they do. I mentioned in my presentation that uh, as of this last summer, 29 states have some ADS-related policy, but those policies really vary greatly. Some of them have some legislation that simply allows track platooning or just operation of a vehicle without a, a person inside it, but have say nothing about testing. Well, some states like California actually has a requirement if an entity wants to test in a state, they have to submit an application and they go, go through the application process and receive an approval before they begin testing in, in the state. Pennsylvania has similar, except that Pennsylvania's is voluntary, it is not mandatory, but they have stated that, uh, well, that all the entities develop, testing in the state have gone through the process and received a permit. Uh, Arizona, through an executive order, has some uh, testing policies and they have a few more requirements for testing without a person inside the vehicle, but essentially really none for testing with a person inside the vehicle. So the policies across the states vary tremendously, and there is no study that has examined the effectiveness of any of the testing policies where they do exist. So, so you in those situations, you essentially have an unregulated testing scenario. It would not be regulated on the federal level, correct? Right, so not on the federal level. And the states that don't have anything or essentially exempt it when you have somebody uh, in the vehicle, you essentially have testing of vehicles uh, or testing of these operations without regulation on the same roads where you have other drivers and uh, traffic, correct? Uh, correct. In the uh, second pol uh, AV policy and even the third one, uh, NHTSA does encourage states to um, adopt laws and legislation to remove barriers that might prevent various AD technologies, such as, for example, to allow a vehicle without a steering wheel, but there is a lot of less emphasis on developing useful testing protocols 
uh, that states can use to determine whether testing is conducted safely. Right, and that's focused on removing barriers, not essentially uh, adding adequate safety safeguards. Correct. Right, okay, thank you. Thank you, Member Hamidi. I want to follow on to the state uh, of the state's responsibility. So as I understand it, uh, uh, 29 states do have some sort of regulations pertaining to automatic driving systems. As of the summer of this past year, and that is based on the CNSL website that has found yeah. some various policies, correct? That means 21 do not have regulations pertaining to ADS, but let's go back to the 29. As I understand it, Arizona is one of those states that did have regulations, and yet we found inadequacies with that. Is that correct? Correct. So, uh, you know, we have talked about the, I'm taking notes because I've got to testify tomorrow, so I'm taking notes like crazy. But um, so, you know, so we've talked about what NHTSA uh, on the federal level should be doing. So what more do the states need to be doing? What, what do we want them to be doing? States, uh, we really are viewing it not even as approach from the states or even from the federal government, but that it has to be three-pronged approach, that all three groups have a responsibility, that the companies have a responsibility to develop a, a program with adequate risk mitigation strategies, that NHTSA should be providing the initial step of providing good assessment of the initial uh, safety, and then states can determine whether, based on their own needs, they should require developers to have additional uh, additional uh, requirements. So our staff's proposed recommendations to Arizona directly and through others through EMVA is to, as a step one, establish a, a task force of automated vehicles committee that can be, uh, has uh, people with sufficient expertise to uh, require applications for testing and to undergo an actual good evaluation process to determine whether testing can be conducted safely. And because of the lack of standards or useful testing protocols, we believe currently that evaluation has to take more of a holistic view to examine the, uh, the developer in general. And so that, that probably would best fit at the state level. Is that what we're thinking there, the, the notion of an of a automatic driving vehicle um, uh, committee, I think you you referred to it, and the report talks about that as well. That, that would be best at the, at the state level. We believe that, that states do need help, and that's where NHTSA can provide an effective tool because they have developed a, a guidance, and without the testing requirements, they need to provide an assessment uh, to the states that they can use. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I yield the balance of my time. Vice Chairman, do you have uh, questions? Uh, no further questions, just kind of an observation here. Um, you know, it, it's my sense, I won't speak for my colleagues, but I will say for myself, uh, I don't think we're anti-automation at all. I think everybody, I would hope people would, would understand that. Um, the automation of surface vehicles is way more complicated than the automation of aircraft, and I think we see that we've got some challenges in that area as well. I mean, aircraft are child's play compared to the challenges we have on the surface. This is extremely complex, and the testing environment is extremely complex. And I think the role of the uh, uh, federal and, and state agencies is to ensure that the process of this testing is done safely uh, at, at both levels, and I'm not sure that we're seeing that. Uh, the other thing I think perhaps the regulators are uneasy about is, well, we don't know what we don't know. Well, this is an iterative process, and in the aviation world, the rules have constantly evolved and become more sophisticated as time has gone along. So if you make a rule at this point and say, okay, here's what we know, we have to gather data, which we are not doing at this point, apparently, and that has to be a key part of it. And then they should probably be assessing the rules at least on an annual basis because there's going to be a tremendous learning curve in all of this. So um, I think we have to start 
at the beginning, and it means leading from the front, not kind of sitting back and saying, well, we'll leave it up to all the manufacturers and the marketing departments to figure out how it is, and when you get it all figured out, let us know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the questions. Yeah, and I'll turn to Member Homedy, but I'll, I just want to make a quick comment on that, and then I'll be quiet. But, uh, you know, <coughs> automation, um, it, 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 it just simply moves where the errors can occur. Where, um, uh, it, it, it introduces its own set of complications and errors. But in the long run, there's great promise for it in terms of uh, improving the safety of our uh, uh, transportation system. Member Homedy. Agreed. And I, I just wanted to clarify one thing. We have, and you know, because you had asked about state regulation, we have a federal government that hasn't issued safety standards. We have states, 29 states that have, but not really. Some of those states really haven't issued robust uh, safety standards or, test or testing and deployment standards. And we do state in, on page 58 of the report, Arizona has limited requirements for the testing of automated vehicles. When ATG began testing in Arizona, the operation of automated vehicles in the state was regulated by an executive order, which permitted testing and operation of an automated vehicle, regardless of whether a person was inside the vehicle. The only requirement pertaining to ADS operation was that someone should direct the vehicle's movement as, as necessary. That was it. So it wasn't like it was a robust system. So when we talk about 29 states, not all 29 states have great regulations. And that's why we need some leadership on the federal level and we need some leadership on the state level. I do have one question going back to distraction, which is on this human machine interface tablet. If you could pull up page, uh, slide number 19 really quick. And I understand that Uber has put a uh, second operator back in the vehicle. So I'm, what I want to talk about is just generally whether you thought, because it wasn't really clear to me in the report, whether you thought this tablet was distracting. And I want to ask that because other vehicle manufacturers could uh, put a similar tablet in there, uh, that in the vehicle. And in this situation, you had, they went from two operators to one operator, and they had um, this tablet, which I guess they had, the, the operator had to hover over the wheel and uh, the, the braking pedals. And at the same time, when they saw something, they had to push one of four buttons on this tablet that was in the vehicle, taking their eyes off the road, looking at what they had to push. I'm not sure how that's really different than me pushing a number on my phone. I don't mean the whole number, but I certainly could push, call my husband. When when Uber designed the, the software for the tablet, they took it, they, they created it specifically to minimize the distraction to the operator. They, and when they designed it, they used uh, existing NHTSA guidelines in the development of in-vehicle displays. Um, so it, it didn't really uh, add too much more uh, um, uh, workload to the driver. Um, we know from the, the data that Uber provided us that the last time the vehicle operator interacted with the tablet was about 19 minutes prior to the crash. And uh, based on that data also, there were no errors or alerts uh, in the minutes prior to the crash. Now, be that, be that it is, as it may, um, you're right, when, when they removed uh, the second vehicle operator, that did add workload for the first vehicle operator. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, this is, this is something that Uber has actually um, taken care of by adding the, the second vehicle operator. Are there other manufacturers that, uh, that have these type of tablets or Envision? Uh, it is very likely and expected. Uh, we gave an example of Pennsylvania where I believe all the manufacturers test with two vehicles in the operator due to the Pennsylvania requirements where one operator 
is tasked solely with monitoring the, of the environment and the operation of the system, while other may provide more of a <coughs> engineering slash uh, uh, tagging duties. Okay, that's it. It appears that uh, none of my colleagues have any additional questions. So why don't we just go right into the, uh, to the findings. Does that work? So Mr. Sledzik, if you would please read the proposed findings. Yes, sir. As a result of this investigation, staff proposes 19 findings. Number one, none of the following were factors in this crash. One, driver licensing, experience, or knowledge of the automated driving system operation two, vehicle operator substance impairment or fatigue, or three, mechanical condition of the vehicle. Finding two, the emergency response to this crash was timely and adequate. Finding three, the pedestrian's unsafe behavior in crossing the street in front of the approaching vehicle at night and at a location without a crosswalk violated Arizona statutes and was possibly due to diminished perception and judgment resulting from drug use. Finding four, the Uber Advanced Technologies Group did not adequately manage the anticipated safety risk of its automated driving system's functional limitations, including the system's inability in this crash to correctly classify and predict the path of the pedestrian crossing the road mid-block. Finding five, the aspect of the automated driving system's design that, that precluded braking in emergency situations only when a crash was unavoidable increased the safety risks associated with testing automated driving systems on public roads. Finding six, because the Uber Advanced Technology Group's automated driving system was developmental with associated limitations and expectations of failure, the extent to which those limitations pose a safety risk depends on safety redundancies and mitigation strategies designed to reduce the safety risk associated with testing automated driving systems on public roads. Finding seven, the Uber Advanced Technology Group's deactivation of the Volvo forward collision warning and automatic emergency braking systems without replacing their full capabilities removed a layer of safety redundancy and increased the risks associated with testing automated driving systems on public roads. Finding eight, post-crash changes by Uber Advanced Technologies Group, such as making Volvo's forward collision warning and automatic emergency braking available during operation of the automated driving system, or ADS, added a layer of safety redundancy that reduces the safety risks associated with testing ADSs on public roads. Finding nine, had the vehicle operator been attentive, she would have had sufficient time to detect and react to the crossing pedestrian to avoid the crash or mitigate the impact. Finding 10, the vehicle operator's prolonged visual distraction, a typical effect of automation complacency, led to her failure to detect the pedestrian in time to avoid the collision. Finding 11, the Uber Advanced Technologies Group did not adequately recognize the risk of automation complacency and developed effective countermeasures to control the risk of vehicle operator disengagement, which contributed to the crash. Finding 12, although the installation of a human machine interface in the Uber Advanced Technologies Group test vehicle reduced the complexity of the automation monitoring task, the decision to remove the second vehicle operator increased the task demands on the sole operator and also reduced the safety redundancies that would have minimized the risks associated with testing automated driving systems on public roads. Finding 13, although the Uber Advanced Technologies Group had the means to retroactively monitor the behavior of vehicle operators and their adherence to operational procedures, it rarely did so and the detrimental effect of the company's ineffective oversight was exacerbated by its decision to remove the second vehicle operator during the testing of the automated driving system. Finding 14, the Uber Advanced Technology Group's post-crash inclusion of a second vehicle operator during testing of the automated driving system, along with real-time monitoring of operator attentiveness, begins to address the oversight deficiencies that contributed to the crash. Finding 15, 
the Uber Advanced Technology Group's inadequate safety culture created conditions, including inadequate oversight of vehicle operators, that contributed to the circumstances of the crash and specifically to the vehicle operator's extended distraction during the crash trip. Finding 16, the Uber Advanced Technology Group's plan for implementing a safety management system as well as post-crash changes in the company's oversight of vehicle operators begins to address the deficiencies in safety risk management that contributed to the crash. Finding 17, mandatory submission of safety self-assessment reports, which are currently voluntary, and their evaluation by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration would provide a uniform minimal level of assessment that could aid states with legislation pertaining to the testing of automated vehicles. Finding 18, Arizona's lack of a safety-focused application approval process for automated driving systems, uh, excuse me, automated driving systems testing um, at the time of the crash and its inaction in developing such a process since the crash demonstrate the state's shortcomings in improving the safety of ADS testing and the safeguarding of the public or safeguarding the public. And lastly, finding 19, considering the lack of federal safety standards and assessment protocols for automated driving systems, as well as the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's inadequate safety self-assessment process, states have no or only minimal requirements related to automated vehicle testing can improve the, the safety of such testing by implementing a thorough application and review process, process before granting testing permits. Thank you, Mr. Slensick. Would you mind going back and just rereading uh, number nine just to make sure we got the wording just right? All right. Uh, finding nine, had the vehicle operator been attentive, she would likely have had sufficient time to detect and react to the crossing pedestrian to avoid the crash or mitigate the impact. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, do I have a motion to adopt the findings as, uh, as proposed? It's been moved by the Vice Chairman, seconded by Member Hamidi. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the findings as proposed, please signal with a hand and say aye. Opposed, there are none. The findings have been approved unanimously. Uh, Mr. Sledzik, if you'd please read the proposed probable cause. Staff proposes the following probable cause. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the crash in Tempe, Arizona was the failure of the vehicle operator to monitor the driving environment and the operation of the automated driving system because she was visually distracted throughout the trip by her personal cell phone. Contributing to the crash were the Uber Advanced Technology Group's one, inadequate safety risk assessment procedures, two, ineffective oversight of vehicle operators, and three, lack of adequate mechanisms for addressing operators' automation complacency, all a consequence of its inadequate safety culture. Further factors contributing to the crash were one, the impaired pedestrian's crossing of North Mill Avenue outside a crosswalk, and two, the Arizona Department of Transportation's insufficient oversight of automated vehicle testing. Thank you very much. Do I have a motion to adopt the probable cause as presented? Moved by the Vice Chairman, seconded by Member Hamidi. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the probable cause as proposed, please signal with a hand and say aye. Opposed, there are none. The probable cause has been adopted unanimously. Now, Mr. Sledzik, if you'd please read the uh, uh, proposed probable, uh, excuse me, uh, recommendation. Certainly, sir. We, uh, as a result of this investigation, staff proposes six new safety recommendations. The first two are to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Uh, first one is require entities who are testing or who intend to test in a, a developmental automated driving system on public roads to submit a safety self-assessment report to your agency. And the second to NHTSA, establish a process for the ongoing evaluation of the safety self-assessment reports as required in safety recommendation one and determine whether the plans include appropriate safeguards for testing a developmental automated driving system on public roads, including adequate monitoring of a vehicle operator engagement if applicable.
to, we have two to the state of Arizona. First one is require developers to submit an application for testing automated driving system equipped vehicles that at a minimum details a plan to manage the risk associated with crashes and operator inattentiveness and establishes countermeasures to prevent crashes or mitigate crash severity within the ADS testing parameters. And the second, establish a task group of experts to evaluate applications for testing vehicles equipped with automated driving systems as described in safety recommendation three before granting a testing permit. The next one is to the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators, and it reads, inform the states about the circumstances of the Tempe crash and encourage them to, one, require developers to submit an application for testing automated driving system equipped vehicles that, at a minimum, details a plan to manage the risk associated with crashes and operator inattentiveness and establishes countermeasures to prevent crashes or mitigate crash severity within the ADS testing parameters, and two, establish a task group of experts to evaluate the application before granting a testing permit. And the last recommendation is to the Uber Technologies, Uber Technologies Incorporated Advanced Technologies Group, and it reads, complete the implementation of a safety management system for automated driving system testing that, at a minimum, includes safety policy, safety risk management, safety assurance, and safety promotion. Thank you, Mr. Sledzik. Uh, is there a motion to uh, adopt the recommendations as proposed? Member Hamidi has, has uh, moved. Second. Vice Chairman has seconded. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the recommendations as proposed, please signal with a hand and say aye. Opposed, there are none. The recommendations have been adopted unanimously. Uh, does anyone have any additional um, issues to discuss as it relates to this report? Uh, it, with that in mind, uh, is there a motion to adopt the report as presented? So it's been moved and seconded by Vice Chairman, seconded by Member Hamadi. Any, any further discussion related to the report? There's none. All in favor of adopting the report as presented, please signal with a hand and say aye. Opposed, there are no, there are no opposite, there's no opposition to that. It's unanimous. The report has been adopted unanimously. Um, one thing I'd like to ask uh, the, uh, the consensus of the board uh, before we move on, would it be the consensus of the board that the findings and the recommendations, in addition to being included in the executive summary, to also be included in the, um, in the main body of the report? We're going to ask staff to go back and reconsider that. I, I'm finding now that we're, we're going, for, I'm, I'm delighted that they're all in the executive summary. It's a good place for them. We're having to go back and the, the recommendations, the probable cause is before the findings, the way it currently is. Let's go back to putting the findings in the main body of the report, the probable cause, main body of the report, which it currently is, and the recommendations listed separately in the main body of the report the way we did before. Well, I don't want to put words in, the, in, in my colleague's mouth. I, I, I know that I feel that way. I believe Member Hamidi does. Uh, I know she does. And, and I don't want to dictate how, how to run business, but uh, I just think, uh, I think that's the way we'd like to see it done. All right. Uh, we'll certainly go back and take a look at that, sir. I don't think that'll be a major, major issue. Well, thanks. I realize we're always trying to make our, our products better. And um, so please uh, give that serious consideration. And uh, thank you for your consideration in that respect. Uh, do any members wish the right to file a concurring or dissenting statement? I think I'd like to file a concurring statement. Okay. The vice chairman would like to res reserve the right to file a concurring statement. Uh, any further discussion? Well, in closing, uh, thank you. Thanks for all the hard work uh, going into this uh, board meeting. If anybody would like to volunteer to testify on my, half, on my place tomorrow, you're welcome to it. 
but I don't see any volunteers for that. Thank you for the good discussion, the good debate. <laughs> I think you're eligible. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Special thanks to the Office of Highway Safety and Jim Ritter to you and your, your, your shop, the Office of Research and Engineering. Um, special thanks to uh, Dr. Um, Insar. I'm going to get it right. Bechik, the project manager, and Dave Pereira, the um, the investigator in charge for this. Thank you all very much. I say it every time, never want to quit saying it. Uh, I've recognized each of you, but it's an entire team that gets these things done. Uh, and uh, I always like to recognize that it is a team effort. In addition to the investigative staff, the report writing staff, all, all of that, we also have the program and the support staff that really uh, keeps the electricity on in the buildings and, uh, and definitely the uh, cool air in this room today. Uh, but we have a financial office, chief financial officer that pays the bills and all of that provides the lubrication that we can do to do our job. So thank you for everybody. Uh, on behalf, our, our, our thanks to Uber ATG. Um, uh, I do want to say that um, Uber ATG has really embraced uh, the lessons from this, uh, from this event. It's a tragic event, but uh, Uber has to truly embraced those lessons, and uh, we want to encourage them to continue on on that journey, and we want others to learn from this as well. Uh, Uber participated as our party uh, to the investigation readily within the bounds of the NTSB party agreement. This enabled them to take many steps in response to the developments in the investigation even prior to our recommendations. The recommendations that we issue today, if acted upon, will result in entities continually scanning for safety hazards, just as automated driving systems continually scan for obstacles. In particular, these recommendations will result in strategies intended to detect operator inattentiveness. And for the first time, today's recommendations will result in required safety assessments from entities applying to test such systems on public roads. Ultimately, it will be the public that, that accepts or rejects Automatic, automated driving systems and the testing of such systems on public roads. Any company's crash affects the public confidence. Anybody's crash is everybody's crash. And by the same token, successful safety measures required industry-wide can bolster public confidence, public safety, and the industry's future. We stand adjourned.